Don't you read? Don't you know? You've got a sister waiting on the other show. There were two of them. The two married. And no, they did not walk on water. I saw them waiting on the shore. Then one of them swam out into turbulent waves, and then the other. And when the waters calmed, I believe it was Magdalene who said, No. We do not walk on water. We wade in it. We swim through it and under it until we find a place to stand, waiting. And when they were back on shore, they put their arms around each other, knowing they were bound together by time. No, they did not walk on water. They filled it with the scent of new life, both beginning and after, waiting for the endless waves coming toward them, ready. But not quite morning. When the waters calmed, the two Marys see themselves reflected in each other's faces. They do not walk on water, but they return to it, knowing their jobs are done, their tasks fulfilled. They have been given an infant, a boy, a man to the world. Their labor over, the two conduit sisters look back just once and see on the face of the ocean an almost blinding Hey, oh Mary, don't you weep. Oh Mary, don't you know? You got a sister, you got a sister, you
Friends, will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, hallelujah. We are grateful for your spirit moving amongst us today. Be with us, we pray, and inspire us to be your people out in the world, to be a people who act as the body of Christ and proclaim a living faith. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as I was thinking about Easter, I did what I often do. I spent a little too much time on social media. <laughs> and I decided to search under the hashtag Easter fail. And I wanted to share with you some Easter fails that I found. They came in two broad categories. The first was food fails, like this Easter bunny. I only know it's an Easter bunny because it says Easter bunny cake down at the bottom, but doesn't that look like a pig with eyelashes? <laughs> a fungus. <laughs> or this relatable moment for parents when you leave the Easter bunny in the car for too long and it melts. I don't know what this next one is. But it is horrifying, isn't it? It's some kind of giant peep monster demon. Looks like it's eating the other peeps. I don't know. That one's terrifying. This lamb, it's supposed to look like the one on the top. They did not quite achieve what they were going for. This Easter bunny, I don't know. The one on the right doesn't look too bad. You can still tell that's a bunny, right? The same with this pancake. Yeah. It's kind of scary on the right, but I think I would still be happy if I could make a bunny that looked like that out of pancakes. I don't know. This cake pop, supposed to be a little chick. Category number one, food fails. Category number two was photo fails, like this one. Oh, wait. I recognize that Easter bunny. He's kind of cute, you know? Uh, <laughs> that was me and my internship. I had to do a bunny breakfast. That's what they make interns do. <laughs> There's this photo fail. <laughs> you can just see the, the kids on the right, like, are we in the same genetic gene pool as this guy? <laughs> There's this one. That bunny is taking that child. <laughs> These kids do not want to get their picture taken. One of them is somersaulting out of the bunny's lap. This possessed bunny. Isn't that the most evil Easter bunny you've ever seen? Except for maybe this one that's going to eat the child. One more, this Easter bunny that's wearing grandma's apron and also looks like if you look at it too long, it will take your soul. <laughs> Easter fails. You know, I was thinking about how Easter morning was kind of an Easter fail. Then Easter fail for the Roman Empire. It was a fail for empire, it was a fail for death, it was a fail for hate, as it showed that empire doesn't win the day, as it showed that death doesn't win the day, as it showed that hate doesn't win the day, that God always has the last word, that love always has the last word. And that's what we celebrate on Easter Sunday. That's what Easter morning is all about. It's about hope. It's about love. It's about envisioning that realm of God that Jesus spent his whole life and ministry preaching about. Today we heard the Lucan account at the beginning of the service, and we saw the kids reenact that. Each of the accounts is a little bit different. I love the Lucan narrative, though. 
In this narrative, it is women who go to the tomb. I don't know if you follow Nathan Monk on Facebook. He's got a large Facebook following. He's a former Orthodox priest, and he posted about this scene yesterday. He said, I don't know why people are always saying Jesus was abandoned. It's not true. Yeah, Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. The men were hiding out. He said, but the women, they were ready to stand up against the Roman guards to go and anoint the body. He went abandoned. And so the women are going to the tomb, right? This was the first time they could have gone. Jesus was crucified on Friday. They laid him in the tomb, and then at sundown, it was Sabbath day. They weren't allowed to do that on the Sabbath day, so they had to wait all through the day on Saturday, and then it was sundown. They couldn't go when it was dark, and so they waited until early the next morning. And they go to the tomb, and Jesus isn't there. And what emotion do they feel? Did you notice this? It's not fear. They're not terrified. It's not anger that something has happened to Jesus' body. It's not even an overflow of faith. It is perplexion. They had expected Jesus to be there, and he's not. They are perplexed. You ever felt like that? Perplexed about life or about faith, about something that is happening? Perplexed. This, this feeling of unease, trying to make sense of the world, trying to figure out what is happening. And so they need an explanation. Thus enter the angels in the story, too, in this version. At this point, it seems like they're really there. Later in the scripture, it seems like they're a vision, but it doesn't really matter. The point is they interpret what has happened. And they say, he's not here. He is risen. Or, uh, a better interpretation, he has been raised. Just as Jesus didn't die, he was killed. He's not risen. God has raised him. And so, there they are. And they are told to go and share the message. And so, it is the women who leave the tomb and who go out and proclaim the resurrection to the disciples and to the world. Jürgen Moltmann said it like this. He said, without women preachers, no one would have known about the resurrection. And so they go and they tell everybody. They tell the disciples, but typical male fashion, Peter doesn't believe her. Doesn't believe any of them. He has to go himself to see, and of course he finds out what they have already known and what they have already told him. Jesus is not there. He has been raised. Now what do you make of this? You know, we're the kind of church that allows for individual interpretation. That's what I love about this church. I love it. Because People are always confused by this. That's one of the things I love about it. I love confusing people. I love making people feel perplexed. But people will always say, Caleb, how do you serve a church that allows freedom of belief? Like, don't you all have to kind of believe the same thing? I said, we all have to agree that we're going to try to follow Jesus' teachings to the best of our ability. But if we agree to listen to each other, if we agree to respect a diversity of opinions, you may think that's challenging, and it is, but it's also one of the most beautiful things you can ever encounter. Because if you have freedom of thought and freedom of belief, and if we're willing to engage with and think uh, through issues, well, geez, that is something that can grow your faith an incredible amount. And so it's beautiful. And so I imagine that on Easter morning, a lot of us probably interpret the scripture a little bit differently. You know, I bet some people in this room and watching online believe in a literal bodily resurrection, that Jesus' body rose. I bet some people here in the sanctuary and watching online believe in a spiritual resurrection, that Jesus' body didn't rise, but his spirit rose. And I bet some people here in the sanctuary and watching online believe in a metaphorical resurrection, saying that this is mostly about us being resurrected in the world. 
hold on to whatever belief you have and hear that your beliefs are valid. And let me reframe this for a moment. Instead of wondering exactly how it happened, because the Gospels don't tell us, read them all. They don't tell us how it happened. It's a mystery. In fact, my, my daughter this week, I love this, my six-year-old, you can tell she's been in our Worship and Wonder program, because she said, Daddy, what's the mystery of Easter? What's the mystery of Easter? And I said, tell me after church today, after Worship and Wonder. But I love that, because that's the right word, the mystery of Easter. We don't find out how this happens. So I invite you today to think of the resurrection as a parable. Hold on to whatever beliefs you have about it. No matter how you believe, you're free to believe those. But today, think about it as a parable. Because with a parable, we don't have to ask exactly how it happened. We don't have to ask exactly what the facts were. We have to look for truth. Okay? We know this. We understand how parables work. That's how Jesus taught, right? He taught in parables. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan, probably the best-known parable there is. Jesus says that there's the Samaritan, right? And he goes and he helps his neighbor, someone that he shouldn't even care about. It's a story that tells us that we are supposed to extend extravagant hospitality to others, that we are always supposed to be loving and caring, that we are not supposed to let boundaries divide us. It doesn't matter if there actually was a Samaritan or not. We've never asked that question. We just say, Jesus told us to act in this way. We understand how parables work. They communicate truth. It's like the story of the prodigal son, right? It teaches us something not only about ourselves, but also about God. That God is like the father who welcomes home the son who has been in exile. And so what is the message of Easter? What is the point of the story? Well, we all know, don't we? We know what the point of Easter is. We know what Easter communicates to us. And I think we all know this. It's not what a lot of Christianity claims that it is. I don't think it's about eternal life and salvation. That's not what the resurrection is about. The resurrection is about the message that hate does not win the day. Jesus was crucified by an empire, and the empire does not get to win. That hate does not get to win. The point of Easter is that hope lives on through it all. That despair does not have the last word, but that hope has the last word. That hate does not have the last word, but that love has the last word. That death does not have the last word, but that life has the last word. And doesn't that have a renewed meaning as we are coming out of this COVID-19 pandemic, as we are learning to live in a new way? Don't we need to hear that message? Don't we need to know that love wins the day? Don't we need to know that there is always hope? Don't we need to know that we must not fall into despair? That is what Easter is all about. It is about experiencing those resurrections. It is about experiencing new life. The message of our faith is about new life. New life. We experience little resurrections like this all the time. We go through Good Fridays in our lives, you know. We lose someone we love. We lose a job. We move somewhere far away. We lose relationships. We experience Good Fridays in our lives. We experience times of grief. But the message of Easter is that it doesn't end with Good Friday. That we don't have to stay in the tomb. Now, I I love a a phrase I learned from Pastor Marcello this week. We all need tomb time. We all have to spend some time in the tomb. We all have to spend some time grieving. We have to spend time with our losses. But loss does not have the last word. Good Friday does not have the last word. Easter has the last word. Resurrection has the last word. New life has the last word. And it doesn't matter how you think that happened 2,000 years ago. Because the truth is this, 
that Christ does live. Christ lives within each and every one of our hearts. That's what we do every single Sunday when we gather here. What we are doing is we are inviting Christ to live in our hearts. And for us then to go out and be the resurrected body in the world, to go out and continue to preach Jesus' message, to continue to live into the compassion that Jesus taught us, to continue to go out and to make this world more like the reign of God on this earth in which everyone has a place, where there is peace and justice and compassion and care for all. Today, we are committing to follow in those footsteps, to be the resurrected body of Christ out in the world, and that's why this is the holiest day of the Christian year. Because today we acknowledge that the cross doesn't have the last word, that new life springs forth on the cross, and that we go forth and we are that new life to a weary world. So friends, Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Christ is risen! Hallelujah and amen.